Hello everyone, this is John Brasser Jr., the Kitchen Table Historian, talking to you from scenic Long Grove, Iowa on December 15th, 2021. In the background is now a private building, but it was formerly the Stockman Savings Bank. Built in 1907 and came to prominence this day, 100 years ago, when two of the worst bank robbers in Iowa history, possibly American history, tried to rob it. So, it was winter. It was a lot better. It's almost 70 degrees outside now. Can you believe that? 70 degrees in the middle of December. It was about noon, slightly later than it is now. And everybody who was anybody was doing their business around this area. Over here in this area was a hotel. And so you had people doing business from out of town, people doing business wherever. You had that gray building down there that was the former Long Grove train depot, so you had all kinds of traffic down there. Over here was one of those great small town combination buildings. It was a barber shop, pool hall, and ice cream parlor. And up above on the second floor was a dance hall that they would have regular dances for the town. Over here was Al Clint's blacksmith shop for all of your agricultural needs. Now, by that time, he had started diversifying into mechanics. He had turned it partly into a garage, but horses were still being used in 1921, so he did a lot of that work, too. Well, at about noon, a car came from that direction, a big old six-cylinder monster. Now, we don't think much of six-cylinder cars now, but back then, this was a huge car, fast and powerful. And it came up, and it slammed to a halt right out here, and two men got out. And they, pretty much everything about these guys, screamed bank robber. They had long coats on, they had masks over their face, like bandanas pulled up, they had hats on, and they had guns, and one of them had a bag, and they go running up those stairs right there, and they grab the door, and it's locked they can't get inside. So they're standing out here now, and they're just looking at each other. What do we do now? How are we gonna handle this? What are we gonna do? So while they're trying to decide how do we get through the locked door, everybody, the hotel, the pool hall, out Clint over here, residents going to and from, they're there and they're just, what are these guys doing? Well, as they watch, these two individuals get back in the car and they take off out of town. They go that way. In the meantime, this is a small town. It doesn't matter how busy it is. Word spreads fast. Everybody's telling anybody. They even had one individual who came across, found out what was going on, and he ran around the entire town telling everybody that would listen, knocking on doors, hey, there's a bank robber, hey, there's a bank robber. Well, unbeknownst to the bank robbers, the two people running the bank, the bookkeeper, a young lady named Jean Marty, and the bank vice president, a man named R.K. Brownlee, had come here uh, let me take a minute here. Switch my camera. This is really my first time doing a video like this, so this is a little strange for me. We're getting the bugs worked out. Well, it's a small town. They locked the doors. They went to lunch. Nobody thought anything of it. So while everybody, all of this beehive of activity is going around and the gossip is spreading far and wide, the robbers are seen in their giant car going everywhere they can. gonna have to get this figured out. They're going everywhere that they can. Just kind of driving around, chilling out, doing whatever. And nobody could quite figure out why they were still in town. They could have made a clean getaway, failed robbery attempt, let's move on, maybe try again later, try a different place. But no, they still see this giant, the equivalent of a sports car driving around. So everybody's curious. And by that time, R.K. Brownlee and Gene Marty, they come back and they're, they're asking, 
well, what's going on? Because they're totally clueless. They were at home. Well, then they find out, well, there was a robbery attempt. Oh, well, that's not good. While this is going on, the blacksmith, Al Clint, he comes over to find out exactly what went on from R.K. Brownlee. Another man named Anschultz, he's a grain dealer locally and he's a friend of R.K. Brownlee. He doesn't believe there was a bank robbery attempt. He thinks it's nonsense. So he comes up to find out what's going on. Well, Al Clint had a determined, had a specific reason why he wanted to find out what was going on. And that reason was that he was a vigilante. Now I know everybody thinks Batman when they say vigilante, but what it is, or what it was then, is that vigilantes were members of the Iowa Banking Association. In about 1920, a, there was a rash of bank robberies across the state of Iowa, and there were a lot of problems. And it was mostly protected by the Burns Detective Agency. Well, Burns can only have so many people and only be in so many places at once. So, with all these bank robberies coming along, somebody comes up with the idea, well, hey, how about we go and we talk to people and we see if they'll volunteer to protect their neighborhood banks. Well, the idea takes off gangbusters, the state gets behind it, the people get behind it, there's all kinds of volunteers all across the state. There's four members per bank, at least four members, sometimes more, and they are armed from the state armory and they're deputized by the local sheriff for the sole purpose of protecting banks if they're being robbed or burglarized. And so, as time, so when Al Clint finds out there's a robbery, that's his job, which he took very seriously, to come out and find out what the deal was. Who's there? Ooh, big truck. Who's there and what's going on? So, he comes across, he's finding out what's going on. Gene Marty and R.K. Brownlee and An Schultz comes up, he still doesn't believe anybody, Al Clint's asking questions, and as they're talking, the robbers come up this road, and they slam around the corner, and they pass in front of these big windows here. And Jean Marty sees them, and she says, what are we gonna do? And R.K. Brownlee just assures her, everything will be fine. We'll just make do, and we'll make sure everything's okay. And they come up, and they slam into place right there. They're big Hudson 6 facing south, going towards Eldridge and Davenport. So, they come, it's a repeat of last time. They slam the car in the park, they leave the car running, they run up these steps right here. These very steps, and they come in the bank, and as they do, Al Clint and E.A. Anschultz come walking out right side by side of them. It was almost like they tipped their hats to each other. Oh, have a nice day. They don't stop them, they don't do anything, just, oh, okay, we'll see you later, guys. Okay. So they come in, E.A. Anschultz and Al Clint run and get guns right away. Now at the same time, a lot of other people around Long Grove had also armed themselves. Shotguns and rifles and pistols, oh my. You name it, they probably had it. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a couple cannons out there somewhere. Well, while they're all doing that, as they get armed, they take up positions all around this area behind trees, behind telephone poles, behind signs, behind anything they can get in touch with. Inside, whoo, that's gonna be a weird shot. Inside, you have the robbers who are yelling at R.K. Brownlee and they're pistol whipping, they're taking the butt of their handgun and slamming him in the head and hitting him over and over and over and again. Where's the cash? Where's the bonds? Where's the gold? Where's the this? and he's trying to comply. Now he's in his 70s when this is going on. At the same time, Jean Marty's sitting there and she's absolutely terrified and they're telling her, it's okay, honey. It's okay, everything's gonna be okay. No problems, don't worry about it. Well, somehow she doesn't quite believe them and then they would turn around. It was almost like they were completely bipolar. It's okay, honey, how you doing? Where's the money? Wham, wham, wham. And they're just beating the snot out of this old timer. 
Well, they get everything they can. They get over $5,000 in bonds and gold and cash, coins. They empty the bank. Well, then they go to lock the lock Brownlee and uh, Marty inside the bank vault. Well, at that time, the bank vault was a timed vault, which means it could only be opened at certain times of the day. Now, that means that even if you put in the correct combination, unless it was a certain time, it wouldn't open. Well, they were afraid of being in there and suffocated. So, they compromised. And the robbers drew this big scissor gate and locked it and said, if you tell anybody, my friends from a tumble will come up and they'll kill you. They'll take care of you. Okay. So, the robber with the bag, with all the money in it, he comes out first. And he comes out and he looks out here and maybe he saw some people. Maybe he didn't. At least at first. But down right about there where that telephone pole is, he must have seen somebody because all of a sudden he takes his gun, levels it, and starts opening fire. And when he does, all hell breaks loose. This whole area is covered in gunfire. He runs, he comes down the steps here, and he runs and he gets to about this section of sidewalk, right about here, and, he's, and he dies. He's shot dead through the heart. And he lies there with the bag next to him. The second guy, he hears all the gunfire and he comes out and he starts firing right away. And all he's doing is just trying to level the playing field. He's just trying to level, get these guys under cover so we can get to the car. He can't figure out what's going on. Something went wrong, he knows that. And he runs out, he comes in, the car's parked right there. He jumps in the car. He doesn't even grab the money. He doesn't even try it, he doesn't have time. There's people all over shooting at him, and there's two people in those windows right up there who are shooting at him, right down at him. He shot four times, he gets in the car, and he goes to drive away, because remember, they left it running, and the car won't go. He's a little confused. He tries to do it again. It won't go. Well, by that time, a bunch of other people, they come running up, and they grab him, and they say, give us the gun, give us the gun. He says, what gun? And they jerk him out of the car, and he's bleeding and wounded, and then they handcuff him. They call the police, and they wait. They leave him on the sidewalk in their enthusiasm, because you want to be thorough in cases like this. The other bank robber, the one who's dead and bleeding out, he's lying in a pool of blood on the sidewalk. They take some rope and they hog tie him, his legs and arms back behind him. It's very thorough. Well, about 15, 20 minutes later, the sheriff of Scott County, which is where we're at now, a guy named Bill Bremer, he comes up with the county coroner and he sa and as he does, he's coming up and there's people. Kids, women, men, old people, you name it. They're all out here and they're all in the street and they all came out to see what was going on. And as they come up, they just wave to him. Hi, Bill, how you doing? Well, he comes across and he's like, what happened? And they tell him. The coroner gets out, they see the this robber handcuffed and he's still alive and he says get him out of handcuffs he's not going anywhere let's take him across to the pool hall so I can look at him so they take him over to the pool hall and they put him on a table and they ask him who are you what's going on I'm not telling you nothing they betrayed me they double crossed me who double crossed you I'm not telling you well they call an ambulance takes another 15 20 minutes and they come and get him, and they take him to Mercy Hospital in Davenport, which is the closest hospital at that time in 1921. They start looking over some things, and they start questioning him, and about a day later, he confesses to everything. It turns out that his name is Harry Hamilton. He's an ex-convict and, most interestingly, a former Davenport police officer. And he came out, and... When he was younger, he was a 
He was a recognized police officer. He comes out, wow, this thing gets heavy. We're gonna have to do something different. He comes out. Well, he went to work. Hmm. This is gonna require some editing, but we'll get things figured out. He comes out. He was a former police officer who decided to quit and go work for a, for a newspaper called the Rock Island News. The Rock Island News was owned and run by a man named John Looney. John Looney ran most of the organized crime in the area. And he was into prostitution and gambling and bootlegging and all that kind of fun stuff. Well, he had opened the Rock Island News so that he could basically slander other people. How you doing? Doing great, thanks. He had opened the Rock Island News so that he could get back at a political candidate that had smeared his good name, or what he thought was his good name, nobody else really did, and said, hey, he's a bootlegger, he's a criminal, which he was, but he ran for office, he didn't get it, he blamed him, he opened the Rock Island News so that he could get back at him and blame them. And he could slander them, and he could throw anything he could make up at him, and he made up a lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. And as he did, he kind of comes on to this thing, hey, we can blackmail people. We can make stuff up. We can run a fake headline. We can do whatever. And we can have them out there and we can have them doing, we can tell them that, hey, this isn't going to work. This is going to be fine. Oh, that's not right. Getting a lot of traffic. This is kind of irritating. All these young people. So they tell him, so he'd bring them in. He figures out he can blackmail people. And he brings them in and he tells them, hey, we can, we can either run this fake news article we have on you, or you can pay us a lot of money and we won't have it in the newspaper because scandals could break political careers, it could cause rifts, it could cause all kinds of bad things. So some people paid, some people don't. There's no records that were kept on that, so we don't know the extent of it, but Harry Hamilton, the former Davenport police officer, got involved in that. And he was there and he was talking to him and he becomes an editor for the Rock Island News. Well, over time, the person who ran the newspaper in John Looney's stead, John Looney was hiding from the law down in New Mexico at the time, was a guy named Dan Drost. And Dan Drost was one of John Looney's former lieutenants. Now, they later had a falling out, but Harry Hamilton knew all about the illegal activities that this guy was doing. He knew about the extortion. He knew about the bootlegging. He knew all this stuff that this guy was doing. So what he does is that he gets arrested for libel, which is basically slander in print. And they come out, they arrest him, and then he goes to jail in about... He goes to jail, and in prison, he decides to turn state's evidence against Dan Drost and testify against him for a shorter prison sentence. Well, it works. And he gets out of prison, and then he gets involved in a burglary scam. They were burglarizing different things. He never turned against his partners, but he goes back to prison. Well, in 1920-21, he gets out of prison again, and he tries to go straight. He's telling everybody, hey, I'm trying to go straight. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to be the, the good guy now. Well, times are tough. There's an economic downturn in the Quad Cities at that time. There's no jobs to be had, and nobody's really thrilled about hiring an ex-convict. And so he decides, I'm going to go rob a bank. And so he decides on the Long Grove Bank. It's out of town. It's far enough away. Hey, nobody will recognize me here. Well, he gets a partner, a local barber named Roy Purple. And Roy Purple was one of those guys. He wasn't really a criminal himself. But what he liked to do is that he liked to hang out with criminals, make him feel tough and cool. Well, he gets involved with Harry Hamilton. Yeah, this is a sure thing. It'll go great. Well, it doesn't go great. Harry Hamilton confesses everything. And at first, doctors are saying he's going to die. He's not doing so well. He got hit four times and one bullet, the one that eventually killed him, passed through his shoulder and into the opposite hip. That was one of the shots from the window up above. So he comes out 
and he's doing bad, and then he starts taking a turn for the better, and everything's going great. And then he takes a turn for the worst, and he dies four days later. He's buried in an unmarked grave in Oakdale Cemetery in Davenport. The Vigilance Commission are awarded $1,000 as per an agreement. If you were involved in the prevention of a robbery or burglary, then your vigilance, your county vigilance commission would get $1,000 to spread out however you wanted. Well, all these guys are recognized, they get their pictures in the paper. Al Clint stays extremely proud of this the rest of his life. He lives to a very old age and he stays in the bar and he actually stayed in his blacksmith shop for several years. The bank here stopped being a bank in 19... in about 19... The bank here stopped being a bank in about the 1930s. It went out of business with the Great Depression and it consolidated with banks in Eldridge. Now, I grew up around here and when I was here, we heard about the story. We heard all about the Long Grove bank robbery and all the people and all the things that happened. But what was really cool is that there's a lasting reminder of the bank robbery. Let's go take a look. So we come down the stone stairs here. We come across, remember the bank robbers were here and they're being shot at. And as you come over here, this right here is a bullet hole from those times. Pretty cool, huh? So a hundred years later, it's still there. What's neat is that the story is also still here. The and it's really cool standing here about a hundred years later from this stuff that I got to write about. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. Let anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you like it, if you like it, hit that thumbs up button. If not, if not, well, hit the thumbs down button. Anyway, thank you very much and we'll talk to you next time. Bye.